This building is freaking huge. I'm so excited right now. This is Poly Soul, home of where Bait Plastics is all made, put together, and shipped out of. And we're here today. We got Nate in the house and Cassie's over there. We're ready to go in here and take a tour and show you guys what it's all about. We are inside of uh, Bait Plastics right now, and this is amazing there's so much stuff cassie what are your thoughts on this place this place is amazing it's like a dream if you love bait making there's so much stuff here i mean look at just all the plastic all look at all the gallons five gallon buckets insane and over here over here's all your heat stabilizers and hardeners and then on the back side of this all your glitters flakes for you guys that like to call it flake all the colors and sizes and then back here is all of the different pigments it is literally mind blowing and we just walked around all of Poly Soul and it's uh, there's a lot going on here. All this stuff is super amazing, but we're actually gonna head over into the other part of the building. The owners of Bay Plastics also own Poly Soul, so that's what allows them to source some of the best uh, ingredients at the most affordable prices. Basically, they're not shipping in little containers, they're actually shipping in giant truckloads of this stuff, and they're able to use that to pass basically those savings on to you guys. It's not cheaper quality it's actually high high quality stuff but it's more affordable because of that and this over here this is joe he's going to kind of walk us through poly soul out here and show you guys everything that's kind of goes on behind the scenes behind us is a bunch of the components they put into the plastic saw and plastic saw is made out of liquids and solids combined or is it Correct. that's kind of what's in this big area and then they all go in the other area and then they get mixed and formulated into the final product so poly soul basically makes uh plastic saws or different components for several industries so there's all different types of formulations different kinds of processes that the plastic saw is used for some things they do are medical automotive outdoor furniture filtration so like everything so the, the stuff for uh, bait plastics is a very small portion of what you know comes through here and is made here. But behind me here, you can see there's all sorts of mixers. They put huge drums under here and they mix all the different components together to make the final formulation. So that's one of the bigger mixers behind me mixing up a ton of plastic salt. And that obviously is a pre-colored plastic salt. That stuff will have a different use. So it's pretty loud here, but like we were saying, all of the plastic salt starts as the you know, liquids and solids mixed together. So you can see it kind of clumping in there, kind of getting mixed in this giant mixer. We're up on the second floor right now. So after all of the plastic has been mixed, there's actually uh, moisture and air bubbles mixed into that. And so all of the plastic salt goes in this giant vacuum chamber. I mean, this thing is a monster. And basically they pull all of the air and actually all of the moisture out of the plastic saw in these giant tub behind me and up actually behind this unit up here these are all hyperbaric chambers so that those do the same thing the fluid's pumped in there uh, all the air and moisture is vacuumed out and then it's pumped back into containers and that's why you get such a high quality plastic saw with no bubbles in it if all the ingredients are mixed everything's put through the vacuum chambers they then go into these, you know, different kinds of pails or buckets, these 55 gallon drums, or into these, which are about 150 gallons. And then all that is sent off to, you know, the customer, whoever ordered this. This is the plastic saw that comes straight from, you know, mixing and degassing. And we actually, at the bottom, put on this attachment and you fill the buckets with this spigot. What that does is it actually doesn't allow air to get mixed or turned into that. Some, some other companies will actually pump out of these into their buckets, which actually stirs it up and adds a lot of micro bubbles. So this is a way to ensure you're minimizing the amount of bubbles that enter the plastic salt. And that was the one gallon containers, which actually we prefer because we can open those, pour it into our cup. Whereas the bigger buckets, you know, you're kind of like ladling it or scooping it out. These are all samples of giant batches of plastic salt for different uses. And they actually have like almost samples for everything. Like right here, this is 242. When is this from? March 24th of this year. This is from March 24th of this year. So they have samples of everything. So if there's ever an issue, they can actually go back to pull from this sample and retest everything to, to find the problem, which there's never any problem. So don't worry about it. We're about to go in this little room here, which is actually where they test all of the batches of plastic salt for everything 
to make sure that it's exactly the right hardness and the right formulation. So what are some of the tests that actually, you know, are actually done on the Plastisol? On fishing line Plastisol, we would run a weight per gallon, a high shear and low shear viscosity, a durometer for sure for hardness, clarity, and a moisture check. That's like so many things. So right now we're going to do one of the several tests they do on every batch and he's going to do a viscosity test. Basically this is a hot dip Plastisol, okay. like a tool grip for like a pliers or yeah. something like that. So I got the Plastisol at 78 degrees. We have a number four Brookfield spindle. Down to the specified line, set to two and a half. And so that's spinning right now? It's spinning right now at two and a half RPM. And, and it's measuring like resistance then? Resistance on the spindle. This stuff is like, there, there's like so much going on right now that I don't even understand. That's why these guys do such an awesome job. I mean, he is a, a chemist. He is one responsible for designing and testing all these things. And they also have uh, actually four other chemists who've been doing this for probably 40 years on their team too. So they have a lot of knowledge and that's what really brings out the quality in their Plastisol. Now we're running 20 RPM. So whatever number we come up with after two or three spins, we're gonna take times 100. Okay or 1.27 R, which is really good. So basically this device here just took uh, two different readings, one at two and a half RPM and then at one at 20 RPM. And he did some crazy mathematical equation here and basically this one checks out. And so another test he is doing right now is he just basically used this little cup to clear his scale and then filled it with the, the plastic salt and then Put a special cap on it that allows all the extra to flow off over the top. Clear the top of extra Plastisol and this allowed him to get the exact weight per gallon of this Plastisol which then allows him to know that it's the correct density. We're back in the bait plastic side of, of the building with Joe. He's going to go over how everything's created and why those processes are, are done. To make Plastisol we start off with what? Well, you got to start out with an ester based plasticizer, or plasticizer, sorry. You're going to pick out non phthalate or phthalate based, depending on the application. We make both here. Then you have your intermediate additions, such as stabilizers and secondaries and thixotropes to prevent settling and hard pack settling. Then comes in your PVC resin. There's a hundred different molecular weight options on that. Blend it in a dispersion, check the dispersion prior to going into deaeration which will pull the air and moisture out of the product. Once that's complete, it goes to quality control analysis. Several quality steps are completed on it. It gets the green light for approval, everything in spec. Uh, go out, lift it up onto a drain rack. It gets filtered through a certain mesh screen mm -hmm. and packed into a tank. Then it comes directly to Bait Plastics and they pack it uh, into their various size vessels for shipment. First off, that was a lot of stuff. So there's obviously, this man is a chemist. He knows a lot of stuff. The benefit of Bait Plastics being right in the same building and, and two of the owners actually own Polysol is that all this stuff comes from literally right over there. So they have all the, the proper testing equipment, everything. And the, the Plastisol is actually made, brought right here, and then put directly into the buckets. It's not packed into drums, shipped somewhere else, repacked, shipped somewhere else, then into buckets. It's literally straight from the degassing chamber, basically to the, the final buckets and out to you guys. So you get a product that's handled a lot less. So a lot of, a lot of people, um, they vacuum, put their, their plastic on a vacuum chamber and they vacuum it. Is that necessarily like necessary when they get stuff from you guys? Or is that just like an added like protection step? Our plastic has been fully degassed uh, prior to packaging here. You know, we run so much volume through bait plastics that you're guaranteed fresh Plastisol every time. So it has probably been deaerated within the last week before you got it. Over time, as we discussed earlier, Plastisol is very hygroscopic, meaning it's going to pull moisture from the atmosphere. So if you leave an open container sitting on your countertop for weeks on end, it's inevitably going to pull some moisture out of the air. That's where it would come in handy if you had your own vacuum system in house. Because that will pull the you moisture. Can, you're <laughs> going to get the air out of it for sure with a small vacuum pump. It takes industrial grade, very high horsepower vacuum pumps in order to get the moisture out of it. Right. To get to the evaporation boiling point of water to get it to actually precipitate out of okay. the system. So yeah, so when it says don't shake, shaking obviously on the on the bottle, shaking obviously uh, puts air bubbles back in there. That's why we always degas after we shake it. But you, in theory, don't technically have to degas the plastic. Also, if you let your plastic settle or sit for a long time, you'll actually notice it kind of divides into two different colors, like a white color at the bottom and a clearish yellow on the top. What is What are those two colors? It's inevitable that you're going to have settling with the uh, uh, hot melt plastisol. Very, mm -hmm. very low viscosity, very low, uh, low solids, very highly plasticized. Uh, what's on top is your ester-based plasticizers, whichever they may be, your secondary stabilization systems, any liquid components. The bottom would be a heavy solids PVC resin uh, and any other 
solids that are in the system, thixotropes, what have you, that will precipitate down to the bottom. Now we have specifically formulated our stuff to prevent hard pack settling. Yeah. Uh, no matter how long our stuff sits, it's not going to hard pack settle on. You can always stir it back in, degas it, use it again. Yeah, and I've seen that uh, with their Plastisol, like some of the like the softer blends we won't use, or we have you know three or four gallons in a row, and we won't use the last one for six, eight months, and it, it separates, but that's different than hard packing. Hard packing is when it's actually like a hard sludge or film stuck to the bottom of the thing. So you really have to shake it or really stir it off there, but I, we haven't had that issue with their Plastisol. But you may see that like from some other brands. In the hard pack settling, it can still be rejuvenated. You okay. just need a really good mixer, okay. a really good dispersion grade mixing blade and a drill. Okay. And then you're gonna really have to vacuum it really well. Yeah, so if you, what you just said is, is you really gotta just stir all those chunks in if it's, if it's hard packed and then really get it blended and degassed so it's truly mixed back together properly. What uh, differentiates like if you have a worm blend versus like a, like a saltwater blend, what is the main like difference? Is it just, like more oils in there that make it softer or is it? There's a lot goes into it. It can be resin selection for molecular weights, um, phthalate based plasticizers that produce different results due to molecular weight. Yeah. Um, but generally it's, it's more solids for the higher blend for the salt water. Gotcha. You're dealing with toothy critters. So we want something like 342 or 362, mm -hmm. um, versus the worm guys probably want as much action as they can get. Yeah. So they want something 112, 142, or 212, 242. Right. Last thing, I, I know a lot of you guys are concerned about phthalates. Um, from my understanding, you know, you're not safe if you're using a phthalate-free plastisol just because it's phthalate-free. You still have a lot of dangerous gases coming out. You still need to use, you know, eye protection gloves. It's still hot plastisol. You still need good airflow. Maybe you can touch up on what a phthalate is or, or how that refers to plastisol. Keep in mind, most of the non-phthalate non plasticizers that are being used in our industry right now um, probably should be classified the same as the phthalate-based ones that 99% of the bait makers in the country are running. Right. Uh, and there's a common misnomer about phthalate versus non-phthalate and toxicity and cancer-causing chemicals and Prop 65, uh, whereas they say DIMP is uh, cancer-causing. The misnomer there is that there's thresholds and exposure limits. And the big companies, Exxon Mobil and bigger makers like that, have done the testing, the scientific research is there behind it, that uh, the threshold and the exposure limit is so high that you will never meet it by using tool grips or playing with fishing lures or flooring components. It's really just a non-issue. And that's also, like he just said, like grips, like a lot of pliers, a lot of other things you touch every single day are a phthalate formula and you don't see people you know, saying like, oh, you're gonna have issues or whatever from using those pliers that have a phthalate a rubber coating. That's some of the other stuff that they actually make the plastisols for. So the Bay Plastics Plastisol is, is a similar product and it has the phthalates in it, but it's not something that we see a huge, like you should be uh, super alarmed about. I've been working with phthalate-based esters for 25 years. Yeah. And I haven't grown a third ear yet. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, that phthalate-free is more, almost more of a, uh, a marketing ploy. I mean, it is phthalate free, so if that's what you want, you know, there's phthalate free, but I think it's more of a term just to get people to. Well, there's two terms there's phthalate free and then there's non phthalate. Oh. There are phthalates being used, uh, and maybe some of our comp competition doesn't even know what they're using. There's such a thing as a terra phthalate, which is considered non phthalate. It's technically not, it's just not an organic phthalate, it's a terra phthalate. So, um, technically, it should be listed on Prop right. 65 and be considered a phthalate, but due to the massive multi-billion dollar company that produces it, they fought that and kept it off the list. Mm. It's still a phthalate. That's... So when I hear terms being thrown around, right. like this is non-phthalate, it's probably the terra phthalate or it's the other one, which is just dehydrogenated DINP. Oh my gosh. That's the other non-phthalate. Yeah. Many, many formulas we tested here and, and that's what we find is those two plasticizers. Okay. Yeah. So if that's been something that's kind of been like on your mind or like you've been worried about, you know, making baits for that reason, you're all capable of making your own choice on that. But to me, it seems like something that you know, we're not concerned too much about in our shop or testing all this stuff. You know, no matter what plastisol you are using, you're not necessarily safe if you're using a phthalate free. It could actually be more dangerous than a phthalate version, which seems like a more stable plastisol altogether. So definitely always keep your, your ventilation going, wear a mask or a respirator, and uh, you'll get the fumes out of there.
just coming here has been awesome for us because we got to talk to him and several other people here and the, the amount of knowledge and uh, chemical compositions and detail that goes into every single thing is just it's insane it's literally like blowing our mind like seeing all the different things that get mixed up in the testing i mean there's a dozen different tests they probably could do they actually do that on every single batch and like we said it's made right over here brought into this area and repacked and sent straight to you guys so you know you're actually getting the most pure product you could literally get and the other thing too is remember like vape plastics plastisol is possibly a little cheaper than other suppliers that's not because it's it's junky or made with less quality it's literally because of the fact that polysol is right here doing so much volume they get basically discount it's passed on to you guys it's not all the money's not spent on freight uh, repackaging things rebranding it's just right from there to here and then to you guys so that's that's obviously a huge huge win that was seriously one of the coolest things we've got to do here at Epic Bay Molds was go to, you know, a brand we love um, and check out their facility and kind of see the behind the scenes. I know you guys love seeing that about our shop, so it's really cool for us to go see that about their facility. If you want some bait plastic stuff, uh, it's what we use to test all of our molds. If you want some of Bait Plastics pigments, glitters, or their plastisol, go to baitplastics.com and check it out. And if you guys didn't actually know, we actually are selling some of our molds through their site to just help the reach and help get you know more epic molds into more creators' hands. And thank you to everyone at Bait Plastics for letting us come to your facility and check it out. That was seriously amazing. I'm sure you guys are all gonna love seeing that video. Also, I got a chance to sit down with Tara and Butch. Tara is kind of behind the scenes. She's the one packing orders, getting everything kind of ready, doing some of the customer support, ordering all the products, and just managing the back end of bait plastics. And Butch, uh, some of you may have actually talked to, if you have any uh, issues with any products or you know trying to troubleshoot a mold or something that they sell, he's the guy you're gonna be on the phone with kind of troubleshooting through those things super amazing people just like everyone else at Bay Plastics. I actually did the interview with them and I'm gonna play that right now so check it out. This is Tara and Butch. They are the two founders of uh, Bay Plastics. I basically run the show I guess you can say. Mm -hmm. um, we get the she orders well out, it. do the shipping, stocking, ordering more jars, glitter, everything. Every time we talk to her, Amanda talks to her, she's like running around doing a whole bunch of stuff. She keeps everything kind of flowing back here. And what about you, Butch? I probably will answer the phone now. Try yeah. to take care of all the problems, yeah. the ones that, uh, you know, kind of filter them out before I send them to her. So if you guys have issues or are trying to troubleshoot something, Butch is the man to help you with all that stuff. What's like your favorite thing about, you know, being part of Bay Plastics? Oh, I just enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoy talking to all these people and trying to help them get going. Mm -hmm. You know, we have new people That's all like the time. I probably have more calls on beginners that how do I do this? How do I do that? Mm -hmm. How long in the microwave can I use a pot versus whatever? It's a million questions all the time. Yeah, 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 we yeah. understand that. So he's like a wealth of knowledge. So if you guys ever need help with anything. I try. I don't have all the answers, but right. I have people around me that we usually can get the answers. Right. Mm -hmm. What's one of your favorite things about working here? The flexibility, yeah. really. I mean, we have four kids, so crazy. we have, we're busy. Yeah. I mean, we're busy here, but I'm really busy <laughs> at home too. This is my daughter-in-law. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, those so kids they, she's talking about are my grandkids. Yeah, That's your grandkids. another part of the job, you know. I can't even imagine four kids. Like we have, we have two kids, and uh, running, you know, Epic Bay molds and doing that is just—it's more than full time. It's like no time to sleep kind of deal. Like yeah. I don't know how you sleep, but. Well, I've been up since three. Oh my so. god. <laughs> well, thank you guys for both for letting us come and everyone else to come along and kind of, you know, see the whole facility and what's going on and. Uh, Thanks for making truly, honestly, like some of the best products that, you know, we've seen out there. Like, that's why we love supporting you guys and what you do. We've got good lab guys and we have yeah. a lot of good workers. Like my mind's running out of my ears right now from all the <laughs> things, the terms and the knowledge and everything that's going on. So, uh, it's a lot going on. Yeah. And that's part of the, I guess the excitement or the drive for it because every day is different. Yeah. Every day. You never know what you're going to come no. into. Every yeah. day is different. We so. try. I try to treat people the way I would want to be treated. You know, I think some of our competitors, when they have a, a problem such as the plastic being too sticky and can't use it or whatever, they just, you're doing something wrong and blow them off. Mm -hmm. We don't. We work at it till they get it going right or we yeah. replace it. Like I said, guys, 
that interview with them was amazing. Those are two seriously awesome people, which is why we align so well with Bait Plastics as a company because they truly care about the products they're producing and making sure you guys are able to make exactly what you're trying to make. So thank you again, everyone at Bait Plastics, and thank you for checking out our videos, guys. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon.